Warren Klopper is CEO of NetShirt, a $40 million MSP firm, which he grew to 100 people and $40 million in revenue through acquisitions and organic growth. Globally awarded Dreams program is part of the NetShirt uh, aspirational culture. He's a Microsoft partner and orchestrated three acquisitions. Went to, he went to nine schools as a kid, only got expelled from three. So six out of nine is not a bad result. I love that. <laughs> Enjoys swimming, traveling, and wine, which in our little pre-conversation, Orin and I was saying that although this is a deals podcast and we'll stick to deals, we can, we can easily speak an hour on wine, mainly red wine, but we won't go. <laughs> so <laughs> Orin, it's great to have you in the podcast. Welcome. What are you saying so much? So listen, before we get into your company and what you do and your bio and all these deals that you've done, I want to take you back to when you were a little kid growing up, maybe 8, 10, 12 years old. What did you want to be? Because my guess is that, you know, the founder and CEO of an MSP company that has done significant significant acquisitions was probably not it back then, but you tell me. Yeah, I definitely went through a few different iterations of what I wanted to be. The first was a game ranger. I wanted to be a game ranger. So growing up in South Africa, you know, you go to the bush or on safari and you have these guys that can track and they can just, I mean, that that always inspired me. And then from there, I went to wanting to be a lawyer. Um, That didn't last long though. And then, you know, as I was going to university, or as I was finishing my school and entering university, I thought, let me go and do an aptitude test to see what should I consider doing? Because I was thinking about either doing like an engineering degree or architecture. And it came back that I kind of should consider taking an entrepreneurial type journey. And that's not why I took an entrepreneurial journey and I ended up doing a BCom. But uh, yeah, it was a game ranger, a lawyer, an engineer, an architect, and then I ended up being an entrepreneur. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And one other question looking back, what was your first deal of any type that you can remember? It could be something small when you were a kid. It could be something early in your career. You know, whatever comes to mind. That was a deal. Yeah, I could, you know, and I actually looked for these doctors because I wanted to thank them. And I could actually only track one of them down that actually moved to New Zealand. So there was a there were these this these four vascular surgeons, and two of them operated out of one hospital and the other two operated out of another hospital. And we were doing some ad hoc IT type services uh, for them. And they said to us, Can you connect the two hospitals? via wide, wide area network and the technology that was this was 1990 this was probably 97 98 okay so the technology that was available then is very different to what's available today and i remember sitting with them actually in the hospital it was actually a sunny hospital and saying absolutely no problem we can definitely do it and i had absolutely no clue how we were going to do it and we ended up approaching this very bright guy who did neural networking at our university engineering course or BSc course. And we ended up using a Linux solution connecting the two hospitals. And at that time, the pervasiveness of real dedicated connectivity was not very, it was not ubiquitous. Let's put it that way. And ISDN was the technology at that time. And so basically the way ISDN worked, it was a digital telephone line in a way, and it would connect instantly. And it was a way that these two, two, two offices in these respective hospitals could be connected. And at that time in South Africa, you, you paid for a minute of a telephone call, even if you were connected only for one second. Okay? <laughs> so what was happening was the server was pinging the phone line and the ISDN line was connecting between 20 to 30 times in a minute and dropping the connection. So they were being billed between 20 to 30 minutes worth of connection in a minute. So they ended up with the most exorbitant phone connectivity bill that you could ever imagine. So long story short, we managed to negotiate out of that. But the significance then, like this long list, Corey, and I'm sure you've got it too, of people that have taken a chance on you, has opened a door for you or given you a chance. That doctor, one of them was Dr. Wright. So anyway, we got that because it wasn't very big. His daughter was out of school and we won that school's work. And that deal was the biggest deal we've ever, we'd won uh, exponentially. And that, that had all sorts of ripple effects. So yeah, that deal always stands out. And I'm so grateful to them. Love it, love it, love it. So, you know, in the bio, you said something that, that, that is a fundamental premise of this podcast, which is that you said, 
you know, well, the bio said that, you know, you've grown to 40 million and 100 plus people through organic. Well, it's actually said through acquisitions and organic growth, right? And one of my premises of this podcast, the reason I started it was that I know so many people, and certainly in your field, right? In the MSP field, managed services, you know, tech, computer servicing, all that stuff. You know, there are so many small players out there and they're constantly trying to grow organically and get more customers and clients. And they should, right? You know, I mean, you should be able to get more, you know, I always say that unless you're one of the tiny fraction of a percent of business that's that's started solely for the purposes of aggr- aggregation and, you know, and acquisitions, you know, you need to, if you're operating business, you need to, how to get, you know how to get a customer and a client and another one and another one, right? Organically through sales and marketing, networking, or whatever you want to do, advertising. Yeah. But so many companies in, in, in many industries, and certainly in your industry, that's the only way they do it. And then there are many, many who are struggling to grow. And certainly as technology has shifted and changes and whatever, you know, it's been a tough industry for some, but you've yeah. grown significantly uh, inorganically. The first thing I want to ask you is, before we even get into any of the deals you've done or whatever, talk to me about one of the things I always talk about on this podcast is mindset, right? You know, there's a different mindset between an entrepreneur and an employee. Again, no judgment, not one's better than another, no thyself, right? But you know, but there's a different uh, uh, mindset to be an entrepreneur. I also assert there's a different mindset to be a deal maker. There are plenty of entrepreneurs who are not deal makers, right? And they might build very good business organically. What was it about the mindset where, you know, like whether it was that first deal you decided to do, you know, what had you decide to grow also through acquisition? And what was your thinking on that that might be different from others in your space? I think when I look back to the smaller initial acquisitions we did, they were reactive and opportunistic. Okay. It, was, yep. it was never, until 2017, 2018, it was opportunistic. We kind of knew someone in the partner community and, you know, they were immigrating or they were wanting to get out of it. And that's, so it was never, this is a key strategy. We're focused on it. We're going to resource it. We're going to invest in it. Yes. And we had a reasonable amount of success with those opportunistic acquisitions that we were able to do. And then when we entered the US market, we bought a business in, they were based in Brooklyn, but most of the customers were in Manhattan. And that's when I moved to New York was in 2016. And we, you could say it was opportunistic in a way that we were exploring the market. We closed a customer in 2015. We were servicing totally remotely from South Africa. And we made every mistake, Corey, you could make except go out of business. <laughs> we spent more on legal fees in that deal than I think we spent in the whole business in the last five years combined. <laughs> And I'm glad we did because it, like we learned a lot from it. And then that was 2016. And I think we realized that our market is erogenous, it's fragmented, it's maturing, and it is ripe for consolidation. And then what happened was a lot of the private equity firms started to enter the market around about 2018, 2019. And now we're they're probably like anywhere between 80 to 100 private equity firms that are making a play in the consolidation of the MSP space. And then what we did was, Corey, we said, we're going to invest in this. So we retained a buy side advisory firm to find us deals. We uh, allocated my time and some of the other teams, team members' time to it. And uh, yeah, I suppose I, I remember this other entrepreneur that mentored me in the earlier years of our business. And I, I asked him, you know, how do you approach strategic planning? Because we've always got this long list of things that we want to do. And we say, you know what? John's good at this. Let's give him that as well. And we, I sat with him once and he said to me, there's two questions you know, ask yourself when you choose you want to invest in a strategy. Is it going to be someone's day job? That's what they do all day, every day. And number two, are you going to fund it and invest in it? And I think when we made that decision, someone's day job and we're going to fund it and invest it, you know, that's when things started to tip. Yeah, yeah. Those are such great points. I mean, I can't tell you how many clients I have in various industries, right? We do a lot in tech, we do a lot in financial services. And, you know, it's very common for companies to say, yeah, I'd really like to grow, or even I'd like to grow, you know, through deals. But there's a difference between that desire, right? And putting a strategic plan in place and dedicating time, resources, people, and money to it as a priority. Then, And that's what, frankly, a lot of them don't do, but you chose to do that. Yeah, and I think the one thing that we've done recently is we've made an additional hire Last year, and we hired a VP of corporate development. Mm-hmm. He came from the private equity investment banking world. And like I look now, so we've closed four deals, you know, over the last three years. We have two in LOI right now. And we probably have another four 
that are warm and could move into LOI in the next, let's call it three to four months. And the way this guy's experience and this leader, his name's Mark in our team, he cleans up, he analyzes, he's consolidating. I mean, it's just, and that's just a further extension of actually hiring someone who's from the industry, knows and understands M&A, knows and understands the way a, a deal should be structured. So yeah, he's actually been wind in our sales, man. What an absolute pleasure. And uh, who are your targets in terms of sort of, you know, size or demographic or psychographic, you know, like what, yeah. you, know, you know, obviously s- some people are doing deals with, with folks that want to retire and get out of the business. Some people are doing deals with people who, you know, just want to come and stay and continue to grow. Uh, you know, some of those deals on who you target. Yeah, sure. So one of our key things is that we want leaders, Corey. And if we're going to acquire a business, we really want to keep the key leaders. So... I think the exception to that could be if we're in a region, we've got a very strong office and we maybe know the business and for a long time and that key leader wants to move on. That's something that we might consider, but our core sort of acquisition profile is the entrepreneur wants another chapter in their journey. Yeah, They want to have a growth mindset and they're not looking to exit. So that's probably one of the key priorities. The second one is, you know, is... We, from a from an EBITDA perspective, we're looking at MSPs anywhere between 500,000 to maybe sort of two to $3 million worth of EBITDA. Um, that's kind of the range of EBITDA that we're looking at. We're looking for MSPs that have at least 60% uh, recurring revenue in their business. And then we're looking for MSPs that have a strong people orientation. So their people in their culture is really, really important because- that's one of the ways in which we've able to scale and grow. We know if we can find and keep great people, then the rest follows. So that's we kind of try to figure that out early on to be able to see, is it a people-oriented culture? Because you have some successful businesses that are not as people-oriented, and they kind of almost believe that, look, work life and personal life are totally separate, whereas we're more kind of, well, we think it's inextricably linked. And then Microsoft, you know, we're predominantly a Microsoft uh, business. So we have a lot of Microsoft skills and the customer base we service is predominantly using Microsoft technology. So those are kind of the key criteria. I mean, our strongest presence is in the Northeast. We cl- closed the deal in Maine at the end of May. And then some of the opportunities we have in LOI are, are actually, you know, one is in New Mexico and the other is in Washington. So we're looking across across the US. Our BHAG, our big hairy audacious goal is to build the best, one of the best MSP platforms in this in the US. Love that. Love that. So you alluded to you know a little bit before when you said, you know, entrepreneurs are looking to go to the next level. But I want to drill into this a little bit more because you know, we talked about the fact that, you know. First of all, you have to come to this conclusion that you also want to grow through deals. Second of all, you've got to put dedicated time, resources, money, you know, towards yes. it. But then, you know, the next thing is, you know, especially as additional buyers have come to the space, PE money has come to the space, that kind of stuff. You know, the good opportunity is sometimes that you know, there's competition for them. And so, you know, one of the things I always talk to my clients about is when they say, hey, I'd really like to acquire and even if they were to take the resources, I always say to them, well, what's your value proposition, Right. To these folks, like you have a value proposition out to your re- to your customers, you yeah. also have to have a value proposition that is attractive to these entrepreneurial firms for them to join you. And you know, you spoke again. You spoke about it generally. Mentioned next level, but uh, I'd love you to drill into that in terms of what's the you know what's the value prop. You know, wh- why if I'm running a you know reasonably successful MSP, yeah. ever you know would I want to uh, hook up with you guys? Yeah, for sure. So I think in any MSP that is considering this. There are a few key things in their mind, and I suppose any other MSP on the strategy, they're thinking about these things as well. So in no particular order, so I'll kind of talk within the business and then I'll talk externally. So the first thing is they want to find a home for their people. Okay, And a, a lot of times these MSPs have had team members that have traveled this journey with them 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They want to make sure they sell their business that their people are going to be looked after. So that's the one thing from an internal perspective. Secondly, they want to find a home for their customers and they want to be certain that the acquirer or the company that they're going to be joining 
we'll be able to look after those customers. So a certain level of sophistication of operations and quality of service. And then the third thing is economic value. They want to know that they're going to realize fair to great economic value. You know, so those are, so when I look at the aspirations of our culture, where it's supporting the dreams of the doers, what, when we came up with that, Corey, it actually came out of an EO program that I did at uh, MIT, that EMP program. It was called Birthing of Giants at the time. Like that, yeah. uh, you know, and then we kind of carried on off there. We did something at Stanford, and then Simon Sinek came and did a session with us as well. And that's kind of where our supporting the dreams of the doers came out. And when we came up with that, the thinking was primarily and firstly for our people, we want to have a culture where people feel they can do truly great work, but they can be balanced in their lives. And then secondly, we felt the next piece of that is we want to have an impact on our customers' lives. We want to have an impact on their strategies, objectives, goals, and dreams. Yeah. So this purpose just fit perfectly, but what has happened is we need, and that that's supporting the dreams that do as we came up in 20, 2010. And now our purpose of supporting the dreams that do is, is resonating with the MSPs we are wanting to join us on the journey because it's not a it, it's not something that it's not a gimmick. We've yeah. we've been doing dream books for fifteen years, yeah. you know. So it's not like something we're just using as a clever idea. So I think the aspirations of our culture and always use the word aspiration because it's not perfect. We have times where we're struggling on certain elements of our culture, but overall the aspirations of our culture I think are resonating with these entrepreneurs that are considering a next chapter, not only for their own life, but for their people. We have a sophistication of operations. I think they can see that their customer base is going to be cared for. And then I think one of the key parts of our value proposition from an economic perspective is that we're paying mark, we're doing market-related valuations. But what we're doing that I believe is differentiated from some of the other acquirers and consolidators in the market is that we're totally privately held, okay? So those that are able to uh, join us in this chapter, it's pre our first liquidity event. So I think just the pure economics of that, one would be able to understand that there is a fair chance that on a 30% equity roll, they're probably going to get paid much more than the, the cash portion they got and possibly the entire valuation. So that's really where, you know, and I think there's also this perception when I talked to, and I was just, I was actually with an amazing entrepreneur earlier, she's, we actually went for a walk and then we came back and then actually we were in the parking lot and he's, he was going to come in and we were going to carry on talking. And I looked at my watch and it was like 15 minutes before we were due to start chatting. So <laughs> I said, time got away with me. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad I had a look. But there is a perception in some of these entrepreneurs that the moment this happens and they do carry on, they're just going to be grinding and they're not going to have balance anymore. They're not going to be able to take holidays when they want to. And like we live, eat, breathe this idea of balance in our leadership team. In our Exco team, once a month, we dashboard. The question is, how balanced do you feel overall? Okay. And the next question is, are you coping? Red, green, yellow. We dashboard the entire team. We do that once a month because we know if everybody's red, there are problems coming. Oh, There's right. problems coming, ball's going to be dropped, and we're not going to be able to do what we need to do. So that's the other thing that we – look, I mean, end of the day, we're, we're not a lifestyle business. So if someone's only working two hours a day, <laughs> that's, that's going to change. But, I mean, if you're someone who's ready to put your head down and work anywhere um, – it's actually really one of the hours, but it's more like a six- to eight-hour day, and sometimes it's a longer day, sometimes it's a shorter day, and you want balance, that is what we believe we can deliver on. Love it. So you mentioned something earlier, which gets us near to the, the conversation, a little bit of deal structure. And obviously we're not asking about any specific deal, you know, that's confidential, but high level. You, you mentioned a, a 30% uh, equity rollover and that actually being yeah. more valuable than the cash. So that would lead me to believe that you're generally doing 70, 30, 70% uh, cash, 30% equity deals on the value. Of the, and tell us a little bit about how you, you know, in general, you know, I've, I've thought yeah. about structuring these things. Yeah, for sure. So we're doing... Uh, if I were to kind of just, without even doing bands, just scenario out, a specific one would be 60% cash up front, 10% yeah. earn out, 30% equity roll. Yeah. 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 Got it. And listen, we got such a variety of listeners and, you know, and the way this podcast has grown and we have so much, you know, way beyond the number of listeners I would thought we get. And some of them are very sophisticated and some of them are newer to deals. 
So, uh, well, you know, when we just, I'll just jump in and explain a little bit. So, you know, in many of these deals, you know, what I'm saying is that 6% cash, you know, up front, closing 10% earn out, which means that there's back end money that's triggered usually to certain targets, growth targets. So, you know, KGOs you have to hit. And then 30% of the value is in some equity class. And I don't know if, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I don't know if, you know, you want to talk about capital structure at all, but some equity class, you know, of his company, which, when there's a monetization monetization event down the line, obviously those people who have taken that thirty percent equity would will benefit from, right? Yeah, that's it. That's it, hundred percent. And you know, so even for me, as far as my intention and why I feel so comfortable in putting this value proposition forward to other MSPs and entrepreneurs is because I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to do the exact formula. Is what I'm going to do. Right. <laughs> I'm going. And when it comes to the, the time comes for us to have a liquidity event, and we, I mean, I'm meeting with on Monday and Tuesday, 22 private equity firms, which is just the initial phase of us exploring at a conference in Boston, you know, what that looks like. I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to roll <laughs> for sure. No question. Yeah. And we're going to find, we're going to find a private equity firm that can, that we can protect the soul of NetShirt because mm-hmm. we know. And that's exactly what we want to do. When we acquire businesses, we want to protect the soul of what we're acquiring. Because if we go in there arrogantly and try and change everything overnight and just to randomly hire, fire people, we know we'll break it. So we're looking, so kind of what we are contemplating is exactly what we are p- pitching to the potential entrepreneurs that will join us on this journey. Well, that. So I, I want to follow down that road a little bit on this decision to take private equity. But before we go there, up until now and and until if and until you actually do a private equity deal, you're doing acquisitions without private equity funding, and I'm sure competing against some companies that have that private equity. Yes, funding. yes. And uh, you know, I've definitely seen that in your industry where we clients. I've seen it in financial services. I've seen it in a lot of industries. And you know, the question often for my clients, for example, who want to get into an acquisition program but they don't have PE funding, is you know, how do I compete? Right. Obviously, yeah. Yeah. you know, the people at PE funding can afford to pay higher multiples than, you know, than somebody else in general, depending on size of deal. They can certainly yeah. do more of a volume of deals at higher multiples than, than yeah. you can get funding. And, you know, and I have a lot of advice I give clients on how they can compete, but I'd love to hear from you being somebody that has successfully closed deals, in which I'm sure at least some of them might have had PE back competitors, competitive bids. You know, how do you compete with the PE back firms being non-funded at this time? Yeah, so there are so many very active MSP platforms in the industry right now. And they can, if they felt like it, they could come in and probably do like 90 to 100% cash down, depending on the nature of the deal and what they wanted to do and what their mandate is. And they have often have times have different approaches. You know, for me, it's like, you know, we're, uh, the value proposition we have with the equity that we're putting forward, the fact that it's pre a private equity investment, yes. if anybody runs those numbers and uh, understands that, there is a sig- more significant economic return. And then, yeah, we've, you know, so it is competitive. Look, funny enough, these, I think the private equity backed MSP platforms are leveraging less the premium in the multiple but more how much cash they can put down. They're pretty frugal. I don't often hear of cases in the space we're in where there's significant premium, like multiples. We're in that ballpark. Yeah. We really, really are in that ballpark. So I think it's more the cash down. And I think an uninformed entrepreneur slash MSP owner thinks that the more cash down I get up front, the better. Yep. And I'll be honest, I also used to think that. And I used to think that private equity was the axis of all evil. (laughs) Then I got to, I read seven books. One was Arit Gadish's book, Lessons for CEOs for Private Equity, which was that kind of a penny drop there. That was one of those, it's actually more of an essay, it's like 120 pages. And then the others were good, interesting, but the one that really landed it for me was Adam Kofi's book, Private Equity Playbook. And once I understood that, I was like, okay, I understand now how this works and how we can act as a private equity firm. And when the time is right and we bring on a private equity partner, we are ready for that because we went through a structured process of readying ourselves for that and understanding it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's such an important point. I'm, there's, there's so much you mentioned that I want to break down in that. Let's go first to this conversation of, you know, you talked about the multiples and really it's more a difference in deal structure than in multiples. And, and that's great. And and frankly, you know, that's actually what I've seen, you know, in other industries, I've seen a lot less deal discipline, you know, with heavily funded companies, all right? You know, yeah. there was this stretch in some financial services spaces where the multiples had gone crazy. They've calmed down a little bit since, you know, the last year. Yeah. But, you know, because it's often hard for these firms that have to deploy capital, you know, their investors don't want capital sitting around. And sometimes what happens with these PE firms is that they do, you know, get into bidding wars with multiples to deploy capital, you know, but it's smart of them to keep the deal discipline, you know, that they have. And so that's the first point. The second point, which is you raised is an interesting one. And it's a point that actually there are some advisors out there. I'm talking about lawyers, accountants, you know, other consultants, whatever, who actually advise this, you know, they always say, oh, you know, the burden of hand, the money up front, like, you know, anything back in yeah. you can't depend upon whether it's earn out money or whether it's, you know, who knows whether he'll ever, you know, raise, do it, you know, a capital event. And, you know, there is this whole school of thought out there, just get as much money as you can up front. And, and I think it's short-sighted. I mean, I, I will tell you, if you're talking about small acquisitions, Main Street businesses, you know, whatever, where you're buying from an operator, and that operator, you know, might or might not make it, you know, they're not an experienced entrepreneur and there's a risk of them going out of business and, you know, and, and then you won't get your back end money. I think there's a legitimate, real debate and conversation. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're talking about, you know, anything from mid-market up, you know, any kind of, I don't want to say real deal, those are real deals for, for the smaller people, but, you know, not even the largest deals, just even small to middle market deals as opposed to Main Street deals. It's a whole different analysis. And certainly, the conversation of the back end equity, especially for a company at your stage and position and the value of that. I mean, I've seen that happen on the clients, you know, and people I know multiple, multiple times where the second sale is worth so much more than the first sale. So I think it's I think it's short sighted. I think there's some bad advice out there that's applied upscale from maybe what would be more legitimate, you know, on the main streets, uh, you know, side. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, you know, hundred percent. And I think people should really you know, really look at that and not take any kind of sort of standard advice, like, you know, as much money up front you can get is always better or, you know, anything yeah. like that, because it's just not true. Yeah. No, it's, and it's interesting. We've seen where we engage and there's a fit and there's a connect and we go through a process of sharing and, you know, and kind of explaining entrepreneurs are, I wouldn't say all of them are grasping it. Some of them are still like, yeah, but I don't know about that. You know, but like I'd say, fifty to sixty percent get they they get it. No. Like, wow, I definitely yeah. want that. We've had yeah, some even say, "Can I get more? Can I roll over even more than you?" More have? equity, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the you know the final piece is this conversation of you know P firms being bad, and you know, and yeah. and you know, it's interesting the evolution, yeah, because it's a pretty it's a pretty common evolution, right? Yeah, you know, we hear all these horror stories about you know that make people afraid. And listen, there there, there, there are definitely examples where they you know where there are horror stories. You know, I will say that, frankly, even the ones that you hear with of horror stories, yeah, sometimes the PE firm turns out to be bad fit or bad guys or whatever. But sometimes when the, you know, when you hear the sob story about the CEO being forced out and or whatever, and, you know, they make get the big bad the PE firm, it's really because, you know, they haven't hit the, their, their targets, their promises, they haven't performed. I don't, see it. They, I don't know, see it. Whatever. So sometimes it's not. I don't see it. Oh. You know, the bottom line is it does change the game when you take PE money, right? I mean, there are certain growth expectations. I've had this discussion with friends and clients all the time. You're, you, yeah. you're in a different game now, right? You need to yeah. be ready. You know, you talked about getting prepared. You need to be ready to play that game and play it well and win it because, yes, there are certain expectations of growth yeah. and return that PE firms have. And if you're not ready to meet those, then, you know, it's more, much more chance the deal is going to go bad. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, there are a couple of pieces where my opinion of PE has changed so radically. On the first side, I have such a, I have such an emotional connection to this MSP industry. I'm, I basically, this is what I've done my whole adult life. And there are so many other entrepreneurs like us that have dedicated their adult lives to this. And because the PE industry now have decided they want to consolidate this market, all of these entrepreneurs, there's an economic force which is driving the, the valuations and driving the fact that they can potentially exit with a, with a very fair to good valuation and, it's, and it can be transformative in their lives. So from that perspective, it's a very, very good thing. And then, you know, we've run the business, Corey, in a way that's kind of, these are our, we do strategic planning, we, the budgets follow strategic planning. 
that then goes into balance scorecards where we performance measure. And I've been measured and everybody in our leadership team has been measured against budgets for probably over 20 years now. And when we're behind, we it comes into Exco, we talk about it, we come up with a plan to turn it around, and that's how any good business should run. That's right. And that is, the, so for, what is also maybe not understood about the private equity industry is that they, the, the way they perform, it's measured and it's common knowledge. What their MOIC is, which is their multiple on invested capital, what their IRR is, et cetera, et cetera, because that is what defines the pedigree of, an, of a private equity firm. So if they're firing a CEO, Okay, they've got to protect their ability to perform. They're not doing that because they're evil. But if that CEO is delivering, and they the last thing they want to do is replace someone unnecessarily, Unnecessary. they've got to deliver because their livelihoods depend on it. Their ability to raise capital depends on it. Their ability to attract other businesses they can invest in, where they're going to convince them to do equity rollover. If they're not good at performing, why must they do the equity rollover? Because the equity is not going to grow. You know, so it's right. once you understand it, I think, and immerse yourselves in it. Yes, they are hardcore. Yes, they are decisive. And once things, you know, if the numbers are behind, they're going to want answers and they're going to want to shine a torch. But trust me, if you're performing, they're going to love you. Oh, no question. No question. So let's take it one more step down the journey. So now you're at the point where you've switched your view, right? Learned and come around on, on the whole concept of private equity and studied it. And then the next big decision, and obviously we're not asking for any specific something you talk into, you can say whatever, but just in terms of criteria and factors are, you know, how does one determine and how are you going, you know, about determining which is the, you know, is the best? Because listen, the good companies are going to have multiple opportunities to work with different private equity firms. And frankly, yeah. if you are at a point where you're so desperate and there's only, you know, one player, you know, it, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I, I only have one player at the family to take their money. Well, you really got to, you really st still should be doing an evaluation of whether they're the right partner, right? But certainly good firms are going to have multiple opportunities. So what are some of the criteria that you guys are starting to develop or look at in terms of the type of, you know, PE firm that would be a good match for you? Well, we definitely want PE firms that are hot performing because the key part of our thesis is that we want to roll a significant chunk of equity. So we want to know that they're going to look after that equity. Yeah. Obviously, we will. We, our my goal as the CEO is to continue as the CEO, and but the reality I'll have to face is that if I don't perform, that won't be great. But they're going to be making that decision because my equity rollover, you know. So like, it's right. I'm a shareholder and I'm an executive, you know, and you need to be able to separate those two things. So the we want a P, uh, firm has got a reputation of performing and delivering. Number two, we want a PE partner that understands the value of the soul of what they're investing in and realizes and gives the leadership of that business they're investing in the economy to protect that because it's an, it's, it's an ecosystem, you know, because if you break that soul, you battle to keep the key people. As you lose key people, so the attrition of the people starts to increase, and then that has an impact on customer retention, and then that's very hard to fix when broken. So we definitely want high-performing private equity firm. We want uh, one that will look to protect the soul and culture of that organization and balance that. And yeah, we definitely would love a private equity firm that can add value and I think in our case, Corey, we've built an M&A competence, but I think when you look at what a private equity firm has experienced, we can probably learn, not probably, we would definitely, if we chose the right part, I think we'd learn a lot from that. And then probably a fourth piece would to be able to leverage their ability to raise capital. And, you know, so obviously capital slash debt, you know, that, that is a piece which we would definitely want in the right partner. And also to understand their thesis. What is their thesis in the space? Is it aligned? Or have they got a perspective that, you know, we don't have, which we can learn from? You know, we've got a, a thesis and a thinking around the space that we're in, why we're focused, how we're focused. We've got some additional pieces of our M&A strategy. Does that resonate? You know, so, yeah, what is their thesis? That's also an important one. Love it. Love it. So listen, you've been very successful so far in the deals that you've done. I'm sure you'll be successful in choosing the right PE partner and continuing continue to grow. 
However, I don't know a highly successful entrepreneur or a highly successful deal maker who has not made some mistakes along the way. So it is with your biggest, uh, you know, uh, mistake or uh, thing that went wrong in a deal that you did. No, so I would definitely say the first acquisition we did in 2016, we made every mistake you could except go out of business. Yeah. We went in arrogantly. We thought we knew better. I remember speaking to the CEO of that business about the way they did client care and just saying, no, that's not enough. Well, I, and I wasn't berating him, but I was just like, that's a joke compared to what you should be doing. And I can literally list five or six things where we just thought we had the answer, we had the solution. And sure, man, we lost every single staff. I mean, we've got one left out of, I think it was about 25 people. We have one left. We kept most of the customers. I ended up doing account management at certain times. I ended up going directly into sales, you know, and I think it, I think to sum it up, Corey, it would just be like, we thought we knew, we thought we had all the answers. And what we've done now, going into these other acquisitions, I go in every single time knowing if I go in with an open mind and a growth mindset, I'm going to learn from these leaders because they know their geography, they know their business, they know their customers. And uh, we've reverse implemented stuff into the rest of our business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just not being arrogant, not being dictatorial. And how do we protect the magic of, of this business that is now joining us on this next chapter of the journey? Right. So if I ask you my final couple of questions, I'm just curious, this may not be specific to deals, although if there are differences in deals, I, uh, you can talk about it, but even just generally entrepreneurial. I'm just curious, because you started out in South Africa doing this similar business yeah. and you came to the States, just give us, I'm curious to some of the differences that you found in doing business and or deals, you know, what you, what, what you see in, in between doing stuff in South Africa and doing stuff here in the United States. Yeah, good question. It's definitely a significantly smaller market. So the one thing that is interesting is that if I were to generalize the MSP entrepreneurs we speak to in the US versus the MSP entrepreneurs we speak to in South Africa, the, the MSP entrepreneurs in the US are seem to be more aware of what is a realistic valuation, what does a potential deal look like, Whereas because there's less deal flow in South Africa, there is this kind of sometimes illusions of grandeur, you know, that a million dollar, uh, dollar EBITDA business is worth uh, $30 million, you know, and it's like, <laughs> so uh, that that's the one thing that, that, that I've definitely seen, but also a lot of similarities, obsessed with their customers, you know, they deeply care in general about their people. A lot of similar technology platforms, a lot of similar challenges, you know, because what's happened in the MSP industry, interesting, Corey, and why there is a lot of activity from a deal perspective is it's become unbelievably competitive. Yeah. So what 10 years ago for an MSP to get a new customer was not a very difficult thing. Now you're competing against so many other MSPs. So it's very, it's a red ocean. Yeah. And that's one of the things. And that's similarly, and we've seen, we know, I know MSPs in Australia, I know MSPs in the UK, it's competitive. And that's what's part of what's driving the market consolidation as well. Yeah, no question. No question. Anything else that you would want to touch on before we go to the final two questions in terms of what you see in the marketplace or around deal lessons or anything we haven't covered that comes to mind that you'd like to share? For sure. Like something that I've definitely learned, and if I think as an entrepreneur at the beginning, how we looked at lawyers was also like a little bit of the access of evil. Like, <laughs> all we're going to do is overcharge us. And, you know, I remember in the early times, we just started up a law firm and then the, the lead partner meant to reply to the lawyer that was considering taking us on. And he replied saying, because I'd said, look, there's a clause in the agreement here which says you can build ba you can build three hours even though it took you 30 minutes because you thought it was three hours worth of work. That's not what it said, but if you read it properly, it gave them the liberty to do that. So I emailed Ricky and I said to him, listen, like, what about this clause? <laughs> so the partner mailed her back, but included me and said, these guys are going to be more work than they were, more work than they were. <laughs> you know, so that's where my perception of lawyers started, a very negative place. Like, if you're going to go into M&A, whether you're buying businesses or whether you're selling your business, you get a great lawyer, okay? Make sure you get the right legal advice. And I'll just add a little bit of elaboration on that and I'll be succinct. I'm not talking about someone that's going to over-lawyer it because you can get that 100%. and you're going to waste money, okay? 
but get someone that's had actual experience with this. It's actually done. So someone that handles your contracts and the odd labor issue or employment issue is not the same person that's going to do a deal for you. So find someone's had the actual experience, get someone good, but be careful of finding someone that's going to over lawyer because you can literally spend four to five times what you should. Yeah, very, very. Listen, I'm a lawyer that does this stuff and I agree 100% with everything yeah. that you just said. So Bart, if people want to find out more about your business generally, or you know, maybe they're a candidate looking to be acquired, whatever it is, how, how do they find out more about you? Yeah, so they can go to our website, netshirt.com, and have a look. See, you know, kind of, you can get one feel for us there. You can go into LinkedIn. You can reach out to me there. You can also get a feel for NetShirt there. Yeah, and if you wanted to, say you were an MSP entrepreneur and you wanted to speak to some of the other MSP entrepreneurs that have joined us on our journey, I'd connect you with them. Because that's the way, and I don't need to be in that call. That's the way to get an honest view of how it's been. And then, yeah, you can email me directly or you can phone me directly, whatever you prefer. I can give my email address on it. If you want to post it when you post this query, or I can give it to you now, whatever you prefer. Yeah, yeah, you can give it, but it'll also be in the show notes. But Yeah, so you can email me. It's Oren, O-R-R-I-N, at netshirt, N-E-T-S-U-R-I-T dot com. Or you can phone me or text me on my mobile which is 917-517-7763. All right. And again, folks, you can be driving or whatever, that, that, all that stuff will be in the show notes uh, where you can connect with, uh, with Oren. Or my final question on the podcast is always about my highest value in life, my highest ideal, which is freedom. And for me, that means everything from freedom around the world, from people, everybody for, from oppression to why I've been an entrepreneur for decades and haven't had a boss and don't plan on having one. What, what does freedom mean to you and how does it impact your life and business? Oh, what a great question. Yeah, I think, you know, and being a dad and realizing as my daughter was born, she's three now, I realized I've got no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> and I then read the Montessori book and she spoke about how what all the, these young kids want, even at the early age of one or two years old, is they want some level of autonomy. They want to you know, put on their socks and choose the dress that they want to wear. Or even if it's freezing outside and what they want to wear is different, they just want to feel like they made that decision. And I think, you know, for me, that idea of freedom for me is that I have the ability to make the decisions I want to in my life, that we've got a culture that people feel free to make the right decisions based on what they think is right for the business and what is right for our customers. And then, you know, look, I even look at my my check-in that I do for my EO forum every month. And one of one of the it's a rating around sort of social impact and that. And I think about our dreams program and how people put their goals and dreams in there and our culture and the way we've programmatized that supports people in achieving their goals and dreams. And I think It's going to sound sort of corny, but there's almost, I feel like there's a spiritual freedom in that for me that we've created an environment that encourages people to focus on what they really want in their life. And I love that. And it's part of what I love going to work. And it's part of uh, what I love about our culture. Great. Oren, thank you so much for being a great guest on the DealQuest podcast. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Thank you very much.